Okay, thanks for coming to hear me talk. Hopefully, not so much rubbish. Can you go? Who went to the party last night? Awesome. Did you have a good time? He's still got beer, so he's having a great time. So I got in at like half past six this morning, so it's kind of yeah. But I think I had a good time. I'll let you know later. So, if you haven't heard me before or met me before, my name's Dale Pearson. That's hopefully obvious. Uh, I work in information security, like the rest of you. Um, do social engineering, uh, pen testing, red teaming, stuff during the day. Perhaps you've heard my lovely voice before with less beer and smoky stuff on the podcast. Well, probably the same amount of beer, but no smoke. Uh, also got a couple of blogs. Uh, one is the uh, Security Active site that I don't tend to update very often. But then the um, Subliminal Hacking website where I talk about um, hypnosis, NLP, social engineering, body language, market expressions, that sort of thing. And just in general, I'm a geek. So I love all sorts of tech stuff and it just turns me on. So if you uh, were unfortunate enough or lucky enough to see my talk last year or perhaps you saw it online, I spoke to you about the different types of social engineering. I spoke to you about the over like two years of research I've done on hypnosis and neuro-linguistic programming. And really, what that came down to is how powerful language is. And something I really wanted to talk about then but didn't have time was how body language and micro-expressions play into that. So this time, that's what we're going to talk about. And one of the reasons that uh, I wanted to give this talk was I speak to lots of people and they say like they watch programs like Lie to Me and stuff. And they're like, oh, so it's true. So you can just look at someone and like straight away you know if they're lying or not. So really, that's what I want to talk about. What we see on the screen and you know, what is it, what really makes sense and what doesn't make sense. Is there such thing as like a human lie detector? So we're going to explore that. And really try and focus on how important awareness is. So we spoke about like last time how important awareness of language is, but how important it is about what we do with our body, gestures, so me waving my hands around. And touch briefly on, especially from a social engineering perspective, but for everybody in their day-to-day -day lives, how you can utilize some of this information for manipulation. So with all the talks I give, I don't expect you to agree with me. In fact, I hope you disagree with me and challenge me. But at least at some point, keep an open, wi mi ugh, an open mind and uh, just take away from this talk even just that one little thing that you think is of benefit. So when we watch TV and when we watch the movies, we all know that it's just like real life. So we know this sort of stuff, this is real hacking. Yeah, swordfish, multiple screens, doing my thing. The blowjobs, they're like, optional. <laughs> or maybe... It's more like the Matrix, when you're in the zone, or if you're a little bit older like me, stuff like hackers. But my point is that you know what we see on the TV, obviously it's not really real, it's, it's dramatization, but what, you know, where is the mix? So just going to talk to you a bit about some of the stuff that I really like, and um, get you on a high level overview of body language and micro-expressions, obviously. Lots of this stuff you guys will probably be familiar with to some extent, especially because it's uh, made so popular on the TV. So one of my favorite shows about this sort of stuff is The Mentalist. Who watches The Mentalist? Cool. Um, so you'll see like some of the mind games he does and the observations he does of body language and how he can tell, you know, someone's a smoker but they chew their nails and, you know, that they were out getting pissed all night. Uh, criminal minds as well. Are they focused on, you know, specialist behavior, what people are doing? But really the crux of it, this show. So who watches Lie to Me or who's seen Lie to Me? Okay, at least probably half of you guys. So Lie to Me is an absolute brilliant show. So it's brought all this body language and micro-expression awareness to the masses. Um, but the one problem is some of it's just like total bullshit. But this is the thing, people, it's great because people watch the show and they're kind of like, right, so I can tell whether my wife is lying because they watch the show, yeah? But obviously, this is probably common knowledge. Most people know this, that you know, even though we're talking, it's really 80% of our interaction isn't what we're saying. It's how we're saying it, the tonality, not really the words, but you know, how I'm standing, how my arms are moving, what my feet are doing, all this stuff, the expressions of my posture, this is how really we're, we're communicating. 
So, I've got a question for you guys. When you think of wizards, bear with me, it, it will make sense. You probably think of someone like this. But I'm not talking about the kind of wizard that makes a mop in a bucket, spin around and clean your house up. I'm also not talking, whoa, I think I went ahead of myself, a demonic type of wizard, and definitely not bloody Harry Potter. Uh, that fingers? So, when I talk about wizards, I'm not talking about someone in a pointy hat. What I'm really talking to you is about this real thing, the, real, the closest thing we really have to a human polygraph. So, these things exist, there are such things as real wizards. Basically, these real wizards have got this amazing skill for detecting deception. They use all different types of skills, which we're going to go into in a moment. But basically, this, this whole wizard term came around from a project that was run a long time ago called the Diogenes Project. And they changed this project later on to being called the Wizards Project. I don't exactly know why, or I couldn't get someone to tell me why they changed it um, to the Wizard Project, but basically they came up with this um, definition of someone being a truth wizard. And the reason it was originally called the Diogenes Project, I can tell you, because it's this Greek guy called Diogenes, and he was a really religious man, and he basically decided to give up all his belongings and he lived on the street, but he was like off his mind. But he used to go around with this lamp that you can see in the picture. I don't know if the dog was his, but, but basically he'd be shining this lamp in people's faces. And what he'd say is, I'm trying to look for an honest man. And this is, I guess, why they called it this project, because they were trying to detect honesty and deception. And just because I like to share information with you, as well as looking for honest men, and I'm not sure if there's a reason why he's looking for honest men, but he was a real big fan of masturbating in public. Crazy. So, the Wizard Project. I told you already it was uh, the Diogenes Project, but this project, there have been projects like this before where people had um, interviewed people and tried to detect if they could you know, tell lies accurately, and some of these tests weren't so accurate, but Paul Ekman and Maureen O'Sullivan, they decided to really push the boundaries of this and interview loads of people, but really ask questions as to why when people were successful or unsuccessful, what was going through their mind? What, what signals were they reading? What were they hearing? And in um, September 1991 is when they first published their results, which we're going to go through some of this. So what they found is a wizard, or their term of a wizard, would be someone that could detect deception with an accuracy of 80% or more. And the interesting thing, obviously 80% is high, but most of us can only detect deception at 50%, which sounds like a lot, but really that's just flipping a coin, so. And uh, not so much in Europe, but definitely in the States, everyone knows what a polygraph is, and obviously they use the polygraph, but the polygraph is only 70% accurate at best when it is being accurate, and there's obviously all the discussions of people, you know, knowing how to bypass a polygraph. But basically, when they did their testing, they got people from the Secret Service, the CIA, FBI, NSA, drug enforcement agencies, police, judges, but they also got college students and just average Joe public, people with no experience, they didn't require this stuff for a job. And what they initially found is that, I guess no surprise to some extent, that secret service agents performed better than chance. So what does that mean? Really, that means that they were right more than 50% of the time, so maybe they just got lucky. But really, so in their first test, they had 509 people, like I said, they found that these Secret Service professionals seemed to be the best originally. They had men and women in the testing, and they found it didn't matter if you're a man or a woman, so your wife is no better than you that telling when you're lying. But really, out of all these people they tested, only 1% of those people were classed as a truth wizard. So that was only 1% of all those people tested could constantly detect deception at over 80%. And if you want to look through the slides later, they'll be online, but this is just details of exactly how many people were in the groups to testing. So, those of you that seen lie to me, I told you just a little bit about wizards. Who do you think is the wizard in this picture? Is it um, Gillian Foster, Carl Lightman, or the guy in the polo, or Ria Torres? Anyone? Exactly. So she's the truth wizard. So, Carl Lightman's actually based on Paul Ekman, the guy that did the Truth Wizard study, and he's like one of the technical consultants on the show. 
which is kind of a little bit depressing because he really knows his stuff. So I just get hung up on you know, people telling porkies. So yeah, so this lady is the truth wizard in the show. So she hasn't really got any formal training originally. She's just got this natural gift to detect deception. And these people do really exist in real life. So this lady goes by the name of Eyes for Lies. I don't know what her real name is. She doesn't like to tell people what her real name is. Um, but this wizard project went on for quite a few years, even after they published their results. They carried on testing more and more people to try and test their theories. And she was part of one of the wizards projects in around 2004. And she was like one of the, the truth wizards. So now she uses these skills to detect deception, helping like judges and courts and the police system. And so she really helped give me some information on the background to some of this Wizards Project. Because who had heard of the Wizards Project before I mentioned it to you? No one, yeah. And so there isn't really that much information out there unless you really look hard. So she gave me some of the some good documents and stuff to read through to try and understand what they were trying to do. So how do these so-called truth wizards do what they do? How can they be more than 80% successful all the time? So basically, they've just got this natural ability. So we're not 100% sure how they do it, but when you speak to them and get feedback, they're using a variety of signals to spot deception. So they're not just looking into their eyes and using some of the NLP stuff that we would briefly touch on later about you know, what direction their eyes are going if they're telling porkies. You know, not worried about someone scratching their ass or touching their nose. Basically, they're using all that information, but they're listening to the words that people are saying, the language, the tonality, and all these different things. So basically, the main thing that they say they're looking for is inconsistency. So if you look at um, some of her videos, she does videos online and they're on YouTube. And so there'll be a video of someone in a court case and she'll basically tell you the process that she's going through to decide whether someone is being deceptive. So she's looking for someone whose emotion doesn't quite match the picture. And there's a really good one on there about um, a lady who was accused of murdering her children. And it turns out she did murder her children, but she was trying to say that someone else did it. And um, so when she's being interviewed, she looked kind of sorrowful. But every time she had finished being interviewed, all of a sudden she had this kind of quick big smile on her face, like, ah, got away with it again. So basically this was inconsistent to what would happen. So if obviously she, if her children really had been murdered by someone else, you know, she's not going to be happy about anything. So I said already they're looking for changes in body language, but basically they're looking for varied patterns. So they're, they're looking at everything. So you might be thinking, have you got this skill inside yourself? As we said already, Everyone has this skill. We've at least got 50-50, you know, toss of a coin. But you can get better than 50-50 if you want to. It's not easy, but you know, nothing's impossible. So if you're thinking, I haven't got any chance of doing this, if you study body language and micro-expressions, you know, you're not going to be, unless you have this natural ability, there may be the 1% of you in here. So you probably know more than me already, which is not difficult. Um, but basically, if you want to try and study some of this stuff, then I'd say you'd probably be right Two, or two out of three times, so you can improve your odds. So now we're just going to go through body language and hopefully overload your minds. Um, so the most important thing with body language out of everything is baseline. Everybody is completely different. So this stuff is um, obviously at a high level, just a generic kind of global standards as it were. So basically, if I talk to you about someone having a, you know, a ruffled brow or something, that doesn't mean that they're lying when you go out of here. Maybe they just have a ruffled brow. So basically, baseline is really important. So that's one of the things when you're questioning people and trying to influence people, you need feedback. You need to set that baseline and then look for the variations in the patterns. The first things we're quickly going to do is very briefly look at micro-expressions. So who knows what micro-expressions are? Raise your hands. Yeah, OK. So micro-expressions are something that's very quick. It's micro. And basically, they're happening in like 1 25th of a second. So they're very quick changes. And they basically happen at the subconscious level. So we really can't control that we're doing this. So like when people got facial tics or that sort of thing, these are sort of things that happen at a subconscious level. So basically, when um, Ekman did his studies, he basically said that there are six or seven basic expressions. So we've got happiness, which isn't on this picture, but we've got sadness, anger, contempt, disgust, surprise and fear, and basically as part of his study, um, they kind of mapped all the muscles in people's faces. And so if you do any of um, either Ekman's or um, David Matsumoto, who we'll talk about in a minute, any of his studies, they actually map the face. So they'll tell you that when someone's showing anger, it's 
you know, 3 plus 24 equals this minus something. You know, I don't, can't do the maths in my head. But basically, there's all these little key things that, you know, we can't control. And because there's so many muscles in our face that happen so quickly, you know, we can, if we try and train ourselves and get familiar with this, we can look for those microexpressions that happen very quickly. But microexpressions, definitely not easy. Um, so to give all of you a taste of what it looks like to detect a microexpression, in a moment, very obviously very quickly on the screen, you're going to see um, five different microexpressions. These are back from like the 80s, so the picture's a bit funky. But basically, you're going to see each microexpression twice, obviously very quickly. And I want you to either make a mental note or write it down. Decide in that microexpression, what are you seeing? You're seeing sadness, anger, surprise, fear, disgust, contempt, or happiness. And then we're, we'll see how successful you are. So everybody ready? It's easy, right? Okay, so as you can see, happens really quick. Um, and you can, if you want to look at the notes, there's a quick link. This is a free test that you can do, so it won't cost you any money if you want to try it in your own time. So, let's talk about the answers. So, who thought this guy maybe had happiness? Raise hands. Disgust. Surprise. Anger. Okay, anger, that's what we saw with this guy. A lovely lady. So what do we see there? Do we see surprise there? Or contempt? Happiness? Anger? Anger? Disgust? It was disgust. This one? Anger? Okay. Disgust? Surprise. Uh, this one was happiness. Cool. This is my favorite one. So, surprise, anger, disgust, contempt. Yeah, so contempt is one of the easiest micro expressions to, to see, but it's really also very common. And the last one, what did this lady have? Disgust? Contempt for her? No. Happiness? Fear? Surprise? Yep, so it was surprise. So if you're interested in microexpressions, so like I say, it's really difficult to try and cover some of this stuff in the talk, but as you can see, it's not easy, and some of the stuff looks very similar, especially fear and surprise very similar microexpressions, but so Paul Ekman, he's getting on a bit now, but you know, he did some of the original stuff, some of the groundbreaking stuff, so there's lots of, you can learn from him. But this guy, I say, is doing some of the more up-to-date, cutting-edge, modern um, programs, David Matsumoto, and he runs the Hummintel Group, and they do some online training at like, decent prices, so check those guys out. So next, talk about body language. Um, so as I said before, baseline's important, uh, we're going to go through the whole body, but obviously you shouldn't look at any of these things in isolation, so you're looking for change in pattern, um, and you know that baseline is really important. So, don't think, take things at face value, but <coughs> since we're talking about the face, a common body language that you will see that is handy, um, especially I think for social engineering, but just things in general, is when people contradict themselves, yeah? So, someone has to tell you that they don't want to do something, so they'll be saying, no, I don't, I don't like that, but they're nodding, you know? So the body language is completely contradicting the words I say. So, you know, are you really sorry about that? Hmm, no. But, you know, really they are sorry. So that's really, you know, starting from the head, that's one of the things I see a lot. 
Forehead. Crinkly, furrowed forehead. So basically, someone that's, you know, got that. They're normally someone that's in a stressed environment. Something's not right. So the situation they're dealing with, but whether it's what they're seeing, they're feeling, or they're hearing, it's giving them tension, and they're concerned, and they're doubting it. If you don't see this, because nowadays we have Botox, this could be a reason why you're not seeing it. Another one that um, may seem quite obvious, but sweating. People that got like sweaty foreheads, sweaty brows. Obviously, when um, we're highly stressed or fearful, we have that uncontrollable thing where we sweat. Um, so obviously, it's a clear indicator that whatever's happening, they're not happy about it and they're feeling really uncomfortable about it. But again, baseline is important. Maybe they just had a really hot curry. Or maybe they have you know, a medical problem. Some people have medical problems where they just perspire all the time. So again, baseline is important. Just don't take it in isolation. Another obvious one. I don't do football, but he's a footballer. Um, you know, when people are really pissed off and angry, they have the temporal vein you know, can bulge out their heads. So some people it's more prominent on, so it's a good thing to look out for. Obviously, this guy's got a really problem, prominent throbbing, throbbing vein. That sounds wrong. Um, Another common one that we're going to see kind of all through the body is kind of hiding or shielding yourself from the situation. So whether it be, um, I should quickly say, if you didn't see my talk before, basically we all have a mode of thinking. So you're either a visual person, an auditory person, or a kinesthetic person, so that's like feeling and emotional. So depending on that, that sort of person you are, when you're hearing stuff or you're in a confrontational situation, this is when you're going to shield yourself. And this is also a good in indicator um, of the, that mode of thinking. And that's important when you're trying to manipulate someone because if someone's really visual and you're talking to them about, you know, if you were to hear this or, you know, I said that to you, it wouldn't be accepted as much because you need to explain things visually. So, it's all in the eyes. So people say the eyes, you know, the key to the soul and in some ways you're right, but the eyes are something that when people talk about body language and deception, people know a lot about the eyes because I think... Um, Maybe that's just what used to be in the media the most, especially um, in the last so 10, 15 years was NLP's been more popular. They did a lot of talking about the eyes, which we'll mention in a minute. So when people think about body language and deception, they always think about the eyes. But eyebrows are really important. Um, and this is one of, another one of those micro-expressions that when you see people's um, eyebrows sort of going in, kind of like the monobrow sort of look, this is um, someone where they're, they're really pissed off or disliking the situation that's going on. They're trying to control themselves, but really it's quite clear in the eyebrows. Are you, so who's, some of you said you're familiar with NLP, but who's familiar with um, the, the NLP of the eyes? Show your hands. Okay. So basically there was a lot of study, and it is, I'd say, 90% accurate, and actually in interrogations, people use this sort of, this model quite a lot. And... Even though I say the eyes aren't the answer to everything, when you're assessing people's body language, it's always good to check the eyes just to see if they're matching with everything else that's going on. But one important thing about this, so basically, I said like baseline is important, so if you were trying to ask someone questions, because everyone's different, 90% um, of people, regardless whether you're left-handed or right-handed, but I'll touch on that in a minute, you are going to look in these same sort of ways. So when um, you're looking at someone, um, you know, they're going to look up and to the right when they're actually remembering something and when they're trying to you know, imagine it or make something up on the spot, they're going to be looking up to the left. Again, this is where the modes, the thinking comes important because if you're a visual person, then obviously you're going to be looking up because this is the visualization sort of part. Just looking horizontal is the auditory part and in more emotional kinesthetic stuff happens down below. Um, the reason baseline is important is because everyone isn't the same. So if you had this little mode of operation, that, okay, if I tell someone or ask someone something, they look to the left, they're definitely lying. Well, perhaps they're reversed. So some left-handed people, you know, they, the way their brain works means they are reversed. So that's why baseline is important. So ask them questions that you know the obvious answer to so you can understand your baseline. Another thing that's um, really important in the eyes um, is pupil dilation. So when we're happy and we're content, our pupils dilate like this. And... When we're seeing something, or we're, we're fearful, we think we're in danger, they constrict to try and focus on the situation. So when you're talking to someone about something and they're trying to deny it, if they're really clearly focused on you, or they're kind of zoned out, then it's probably accurate that 
what you're talking about, they're not happy about. We mentioned it before, especially someone who's a visual person. If you're talking to someone about something, even if you're not showing them, you know, they're, they're going to possibly cover their eyes. Not obviously as obvious as this, but you, know, you may see them kind of going, oh, well, you know, it was a long time ago and I can't really remember what, what I was thinking about. And another thing with the eyes that I think is a, a general misconception. So people think when I'm lying, or yeah, so if I'm lying, when I'm trying to pretend that I'm telling the truth, I'm going to give you like 100% eye contact. So I must be telling the truth because, you know, if I was lying, I wouldn't be able to look at you direct in the face when reality is the actual opposite thing happens. So when we are telling the truth, you know, we're not just staring people out and freaking them out by staring into their eyes. So that's a good one. The nose. So the nose is important as well. The, the nose crinkling, we'll talk about kids a little bit later. Um, but basically kids give off their micro expressions and body languages. You know, they haven't learned that it's bad to tell lies and try and disguise all the things, so it's much easier to learn their body language. But the nose crinkling is, you know, is a clear sign of displeasure. And so they're not happy or perhaps they're, they're stressed. The touching or grabbing of the nose, that's something that people do for pacification. And um, maybe if um, they're a kinesthetic type emotional person, maybe it's also that um, they can smell the bullshit they're talking about. Another one, because Bosch Bryce is an excellent example of this, is people that think they've got the upper hand or they're more superior to you will have that kind of, I call it like the, the snooty nose, you know, you walk around with your nose up in the air because you think you're better than everyone else. And basically that's a sign that you know, they feel that they're super confident. So when you challenge that, that sort of person, and basically the opposite happens, so they start looking down, and that's a clear sign that obviously what you're discussing with them, you know, now they're getting worried. And um, another thing, just totally off topic because I'm interested in magic and all that sort of thing, the nose is actually um, something like that people do subconsciously so if you just did a simple magic trick, like trying to guess what coin is in someone's hand, the direction of their nose is almost like they're trying to sniff out the truth. That could actually be the, the hand the coin's in, so you can try that. And people try and trick you. So the next thing we talk about is the mouth. Um, when people are really stressed or concerned, they have this compressed, pursed lips look about themselves. So, you know, they're kind of trying to hold in the thing they're doing. Another one, again, the blocking or the covering of the mouth. It's almost like they, they're trying to stop themselves, you know, telling the truth. They don't want the, it to escape. Another thing similar with, you know, rubbing the nose is biting the lip. This, again, is another pacification situation. So when people are stressed or concerned, they may do this. Um, people also licking, licking their lips, that sort of thing. But of course, baseline is important. Perhaps they've just got really dry lips. Another thing about the lips is um, it's very difficult to tell unless you're really close, but our lips actually change size um, based on the emotions we experience in the time. So when we're really happy and comfortable in a situation, we have like big, full, voluptuous, like um, Angelina Jolie you know, type lips. And um, you'll see those reduce slightly when we're starting to get stressed or, or high tension. Another thing that's really important um, is the smile. Um, so if you do some more research on micro expressions, you'll, you'll see that basically when we give a real smile, other things are happening with our eyes, like the, you know, the crow's feet. Again, if people have got Botox, you're not going to see it as obviously. But when someone's trying to tell you they're happy or they're confident in something they're saying or trying to deceive you, you know, obviously a fake smile is a dead giveaway that they're trying to pull the wool over your eyes. Ears. Um, ears don't really have a lot to tell you, obviously. They're for listening. Um, but one thing you do see again is people rub their ears um, for pacification. And this is actually something that I wasn't aware of until I saw a video of myself when I was doing um, some of this research and testing other people. But basically, when I'm in a situation of discomfort and stress, I rub my ear. Um, so I did some research on perhaps why I'm rubbing the back of my ear. And there's like pressure points kind of around here. So perhaps I'm trying to pacify myself that way. So if you see me rubbing my ear, you know, I'm not very comfortable. Uh, the neck, the neck's also um, quite a, a good indicator for us. Um, when I've done some of this research, I find that women seem to be more noticeable in this because um, body temperature and things, which we're not going to cover today, that obviously is a, a good example of people's emotions. But you'll find that 
in high stress situations, people you know, rubbing or touching their neck to, again, to pacify themselves. And that also can sometimes be accompanied by like blotching of the skin and when they're really stressed and trying to act calmly. Um, another thing you might see is people kind of stretching and you know, rotating their neck, trying to relieve stress. It's a natural thing that we're trying to do, but they try and mask this you know, by messing with their collar or something like this um, to try and deceive us. Neck tilting uh, is another really important um, piece of body language, especially if you're trying to manipulate someone. Uh, who, who here has got a dog? Okay, again, bear with me. So have you ever had it when you're talking to your dog and for that some reason you really think they understand what you're saying and they do that head tilt you thing like, we're going out for a walk? Um, so basically this is what we do as humans. So we're neck tilting, so basically they're really interactive with what you're saying. So again, if this changes, you know that one, you're losing them, they're disengaging. So from a manipulation perspective, uh, if you're trying to convince someone or manipulate someone, slight head tilting can be really important. Um, but that's, this is kind of like a more, more relaxed tilting. But you'll see when it becomes um, more rigid, basically it's a good indicator that they're, they're stressed or you know, they're starting to get really uncomfortable about it. And sometimes you even see it so much that kind of like, they almost look frozen in that look like, oh shit, I just said the wrong thing. Um, and basically, it's like that rabbit in the headlights type of thing. It's, um, it's an interesting one. I love legs. Um, so legs, again, basically, once you start to get past the waist, so some of this stuff that we spoke about already, I'm sure most of you kind of might say, oh, that was obvious. Well, you know, I, I knew about the eyes or, you know, well, of course you rub your head for pacification or something. But even though lots of this all happen at a subconscious level, um, you know, you can see when your hands are wiggling around or you might realize after a minute that you know you were you were grabbing your nose but consciously um, when it gets below the waist we kind of don't really think about the body language that's happening down below and that the reason for that being that you know, normally we're sat down or behind a desk or behind a podium and um, so we don't even think about the body language that our lower body gives off and in fact this is really important body language that we can use to give us even more information so one of the things you obviously you sometimes see, this is a bad example, but it's, I had trouble trying to <laughs> find some pictures of this stuff. Um, but basically, when people you know, grabbing their knees, either they're trying to comfort themselves, or almost restrain themselves from carrying on. So if you see, if someone was sat down, um, you might see this in interviews, you know, if you're interviewing employees or something, when they start to get um, a bit uncomfortable, perhaps about the questions you're asking them and challenging them on like, previous experience, you see them kind of holding themselves back. You know, they want to escape, but they can't. Um, here, again, baseline is important. Lots of women, for obvious reasons, if they're wearing a skirt, may sit with their legs closed. But basically, when we're, when we're really confident, we will you know, sit or stand you know, with our legs akimbo. And um, when you start to see that change, obviously they're starting to lack confidence. So if you were asking people questions and they were like, yeah, man, this is cool, I'm not worried. And then they kind of, you start to pressure them, but their tonality stays the same, I think, but their legs are closed, and then you know that you're putting them under pressure. Cross legs again. Again, women do it a lot for obvious reasons. Um, but basically, this is a clear example of body language. And if any of you guys are interested in being like a pickup artist or something, um, some of the training you'll get for that, um, they say like the, the crossing legs is putting up a barrier, so you can tell if you're going to be successful in pulling the chick based on which ways uh, our legs are showing. Um, but basically, it's a sign that you know, maybe they're, they're fearful and they're trying to, again, it's a trying to comfort themselves type situation. I mean, mentioned this earlier, but this one is really one of the things that I, I use most of the time when you're trying to manipulate or um, influence someone. Basically, it's like an animalistic instinct that basically, to be confident or um, to be more authoritative, especially with men, but everyone, we, we try and take up as much room as possible, yeah? So you see, like, you know, when you're trying to get in the club, not only is the bouncer trying to fill the door, but it's like, you know, you're not coming past me because, you know, I'm really big. And so basically, when you're trying to manipulate someone, you can use that to your advantage. So, you know, just have your legs splayed slightly more than them, or if when you're trying to manipulate them, they're starting to, you know, bow down to your willing, you'll see that the legs start to close up. So this is a, a clear way to, to see that, you know, if you're trying to, interact with someone, if they think they're really dominant, you know, how you're going to have to handle it. And obviously, then when their legs are closing, you know that you're starting to win or they're getting fearful. Um, another thing that you'll see when this is slightly different, is if someone's standing cross-legged, because that's how they normally stand, 
all of a sudden they move to this legs playing um, reaction, it's that fight or flight um, tendency that they're getting ready to, to dash off. So now we'll talk about the feet. So the feet um, of Joe Navarro, who we, I mentioned at the moment, um, he's written in his book some really good stuff on the feet. And I never really noticed this before until I read his book and then started watching people, and he's absolutely right. So basically people, you know, you see people tapping their feet. That can be a sign that um, you know, they're in a high-stress environment, or maybe they just like to tap their feet. So again, baseline's important. But when, um, especially when people are sat and they feel restricted or they're under pressure, you'll see them trying to start to close in, so they will move their feet in like this into the chair to try and comfort themselves. When they're really bricking it, then um, they start to lock their feet into the chair. Again, they really want to be rooted and secure. And so basically, you just, you just see them shuffling back further and further and further. But where I think it gets really interesting, and I definitely recommend that um, you, you try, even when you interact with people out here later, and then uh, you'll see what they're saying, not people that have been to see this talk. But basically, the direction of our feet are in can really tell us a lot. So when we're properly interacting with someone, uh, even if we're in a rush and we're fully committed to someone, normally we stand, you know, body to body, feet to feet. But then, if either we don't like what's happening, or you know, maybe we're running late for something, you'll see that our feet change. Yeah. So I might be really happy to be here, but then you see me kind of stand like this. And basically, what's happening subconsciously is I'm thinking I really want to get out of this situation, and the way that my foot is pointing to the door there is a clear indication that I just want to get out of that door as soon as possible. Another thing you'll see when people are uncomfortable, I call it the, the childlike feet thing where the feet go in. You can imagine a kid doing it kind of like, oh shit, I got caught again. Um, so this is a common thing. So I really think that when you're speaking to people, um, it's not so much about, you know, it can be used obviously to detect deception and stuff, um, but as much as building rapport. So when you're speaking to someone, um, even just trying to you know, be friendly with them, it might be that um, you start to lose them and you see their feet go. It might be not because you're putting them under pressure or they want to be rude, but you know, they're running late. So it can help to build rapport to recognize that and say, oh, you know, I really think I appreciate you're probably in a hurry, so I'll let you go. So that's important. Hands. Hands do a lot of talking. Again, some of this stuff probably be quite obvious because we see our hands moving around all the time. But obviously, high-stressed environment. You know, we want to pull our hair out. This is why... I've got hardly any hair because I'm really stressed at work. Another thing, again, you see a lot when people are really confident. It's similar to the legs playing. They're trying to take up as much room as possible. But one of the things that, um, when it comes to the hands, that you might see is, again, this isn't for everybody, but if someone stands like this and their thumbs are pointing backwards, that can be a sign that they're not happy. So they're disgruntled about the situation or what's being discussed. On well, the opposite being, if they're standing the other way with their thumbs pointing forward, that can be a sign that they're curious or confused about what's happening. So just those small things can you know, give you an indication of what's happening you know, mentally. Hand steepling. This is a common thing when people are trying to show how confident and dominant they are. When you see this change to kind of the, the interlocking, this again is a sign, it's like a pacification thing, they're locking down. When you see the steepling, you know, you may see it like this, or maybe you just see like a couple of fingers, but basically it all means the same thing. And when we're communicating with people, when our body language, you know, like I said already, is over like 80% of it, um, when we're open and honest and interacting and we really want to be involved with someone, we'll have our palms up and open in a non-threatening way, you know, like you can slash my wrists, maybe what you want to do after I listen to the talk. <laughs> or when we're trying to be um, more dominant and we don't want to be open, we don't want to discuss anything, you know, we're going to have our hands down, very authoritative, very dictative. And the same thing goes for hands um, when they're on the table or on a podium like this. So if someone was looking really confident, but, you know, they were just holding by the side, that also shows they're fairly confident. But maybe if they've got their hands splayed right open, again, they're trying to take up as much space as possible to look really confident. Another thing about the hands, uh, when people are standing, you know, trying to, trying to be really cool, you may notice that, like in this picture here, the guy has got his thumbs on display as opposed to, to inside. And basically, with the thumbs out, is a clear sign that this guy is really confident, he's really assertive and confident in himself. What, and we tend to either, for some reason, I don't know why it's the thumbs, but 
we hide our thumbs when we feel threatened uh, or we find ourselves in a situation we're not sure about. So again, baseline is important because you know maybe that's just how you stand. Doesn't mean that you're you're not confident and you're crapping yourself. So that's why baseline is important. So something to be aware of there. Fingers. Um, Fingers are important again. This is similar to what we talked about before, about ventilation. So again, another reason why I haven't got any hair, because I'm probably rubbing my hands, my fingers through my hair all the time. But basically, when we're stressed or concerned or doubtful or under pressure, this is something you'll see. Going back to picking up chicks, um, this is another thing that when, um, it can be also a sign that we're in a good mood, you know, when we're twiddling with our hair and wrapping it around our finger. Um, so basically, it shines that we're we're positive, trying to give a positive signal. So when you're trying to pull a pull a girl and she's like, "Oh yeah, I think you're really cute and stuff," it's a winner. <laughs> but one of my favourite ones that you will see a lot, um, I see it a lot in like in meetings or stuff where people are sat down. But basically, really, when you you know like Barack here is obviously not impressed. So when you're in a meeting and someone's telling you something, you're like. Fuck you, you know, I really couldn't give a shit about what you're saying. You may find that, without even realising it, you know, you're sat there, or you maybe adjust your glasses or, or something. So, you know, subconsciously you don't really realise you're overtly doing it, but this is a clear sign that, you know, someone's not really happy and when they're itching, you might want to watch what they're doing with their fingers. Are they itching like this or they're like, mm, yeah, I think so. Arms. Arms don't really have uh, a great deal to tell us. Um, but similar to the legs playing, um, if you, any of you guys are interested in poker, who plays poker? Any of the Irish guys? Yeah. Um, Joe Navarro, again, um, he's one of the experts on body language and he's written a book just completely dedicated to, to poker playing and stuff. So these are just a couple of pictures I thought were good examples. So this guy has obviously got his poker face on. But what you can tell about him, like I said before with the legs play, but this time with the arms is, his arms are quite close in, he's protecting himself. So you know, he's trying to protect and block himself from the outside world. So really he's not that confident about the hand or the move that's about to be played. Whereas this guy on the other hand, super confident, taking up lots of room. He's feeling really authoritative, authoritative and strong, real strong posture about what's about to happen. So he hasn't really got any negative feelings or fear or concern about what's about to happen. Shoulders. I'd say shoulders are very similar to micro expressions because you're only looking for like slight changes in the shoulders. And this is kind of a, a good example of a picture because it's not so clear, but you can see that this lady, her one shoulder is slightly tilted. And basically this is a, a sign of insecurity or lacking confidence. So if when you're speaking to someone you kind of see just a slight kind of change, it could be a sign that they're starting to lack confidence in what you're talking about. This one we've all seen when you're kind of like, oh shit. Like your tortoise trying to retract into yourself. Um, so that shoulder shrugging thing is a clear thing of like, oh, I don't know, or maybe you've just made a mistake or let out some information. Another one that I, do, I see a lot as well is this um, shoulder rubbing. So again, it's a pacification thing, but you'll also see it's accompanied normally by you know, the crossing over. So you don't kind of scratch your shoulder like this when it feels weird, but um, you know, you're caressing yourself, but also blocking yourself in from what's happening as well. Because you know, of our heart and things, our chest is vulnerable, so that's why we're blocking it. Torso, so, you know, well, I guess not our whole body, but you know, we consider this to be the main part of our body. And that's something that um, is really important as well when we're communicating with people. So I mentioned it already with the feet, but basically when we're confident and being open and honest with someone, we're interacting with them, um, you know, we're going to have our bodies face on, not side to the side. And this isn't a great picture because of how the woman um, is holding her books, but we'd imagine there was a baseline there. But when we're feeling stressed and we need to comfort ourselves, you know, we're, we're block ourselves. So either, you know, it's a, well, you've seen it all the time, you know, when people aren't happy or they're a bit pissed off, or maybe they hold a bag in front of them. And if you were at the bar last night, you could see a couple of people uh, with cushions because um, there were some strange things going on, so I think they're probably a bit worried. Um, another thing, again, similar... You're protecting yourself, but this can sometimes be accompanied, especially if sat down, like with kind of a rocking motion. Uh, I don't know how accurate it is, but apparently they um, did some studies on bears that have been kept in captivity for like tricks and things, and you'll see that all these bears for, you know, do this rocking thing. And apparently it releases serotonin or something to help with stress, so maybe this is what we're doing. And leaning in. So this is a picture from last night. Of course. Uh, 
Um, but basically, when we're really engaged and interested in someone, we're going to lean into them, yeah? So different cultures. Um, we'll talk very quickly about proxemics, because we've only got a few minutes left. Um, but basically, you know, how close we are when we're in touch with someone is really important. So just to wrap up, basically, as I mentioned before, kids are really easy to read. I'm not going to recommend you go or go start out looking at kids, because that would get you in trouble. But I think it's clear to everyone here, you know, whether you're interested in body language or not, this guy is not happy. I think he got his chocolate taken away from us, I think. But the important thing, uh, especially because you know, I'm English and some of you are Swiss and Spanish or all these different things, um, you know, body language is a global thing. I spoke to you about the high-level body language, the general stuff we see. But basically, you need to be really aware of both the gestures that you do, because the gestures you give off will affect other people's body language. But you have to keep things into context, yeah? So in the UK and America, this is good, this is nice. Um, but you know, to an Italian person, that might not mean a good thing, that might be number one. And in Japan, apparently, that means number five. Anyone from Greece? Apparently, that means up yours? Yeah. See, so you, know, you have to be careful. You might be like, oh, you had a good time. And they're like, fuck you. <laughs> Again, another thing, you know, to me, that means OK. But to someone in Japan, that isn't OK. That's zero. I haven't got anything. Um, apparently, any people, any Turkish or Brazilian people here? No? Don't know if it's true, but apparently that's an insult as well. So, I don't know. Um, I saw a lot of this last night. Um, but, you know, rocking on is really good for us. Uh, but apparently, if you're in Italy, that's a really insulting thing. You might have to stay in jail for the night. So, again... It's really important to be mindful of what's happening and the gestures you're giving off and the trouble it's going to get you in. So remember, when you're interacting with people, you want them to be open and honest. Be palms up. If you don't want to piss people off, hands down. And again, we saw some of this last night when people get a few minute drinks, you know, this poking gesture. Not Facebook poking, that's a, that's a different thing. But basically, it's like a form of inti intimidation, so it's not going to go down too well. So... If you're interested in some of this stuff, you want to learn more about body language, Joe Navarro, like 110% recommend his stuff. He's got lots of books, and he used to be an FBI, ag FBI agent, so he really knows his things. Uh, Robert Phipps and Mark Bowden, um, I haven't read as much as their stuff, because, you know, in my opinion, Joe really covers most of his stuff off, and he really knows what it's on about. Again, we briefly mentioned proxemics. This is going to be, this is like the Western view. But basically, when you're interacting with people, try to manipulate them, you need to be aware of, you know, based on where you are, how close or not you should be standing to them. So real quickly, deception. Do you know why this is deceptive? So basically, if you ever get really lucky with a girl and she looks like she's got great tits and then she takes her bra off, <laughs> deceptive. They call it the shepherd's bra. Round them up and put them in the right direction. Um, <laughs> So basically, when you, how can you use this stuff to deceive people? So basically, if you can understand the body language, when you're trying to manipulate someone or deceive them, you can see when things are starting to go wrong. So, you know, if the head tilting's all, all good, but then they start to be like, mm, I think he's kind of make it up now. This is where it's really important. And if I, have I got two minutes? Okay, cool. Uh, if you know from my um, previous talks, I like magic, and I try and do some trickery to prove a point. So we're going to try this now. So, real quick, I'm going to show you a deck of cards. I'm going to deal with the cards onto the table. I just want you to concentrate on the cards I'm dealing and follow my instructions. So, I'm going to deal the cards down. I'm sure most of you know, in a deck of cards, you've got black cards and you've got red cards. How many more red cards do I put down? Fifteen cards? People see fifteen cards? Who saw the hidden message? Okay. So if you watch the back of cards, if you didn't see the hidden message this time, so instead of focusing on this bit, focus on the bit in my hand. Okay, so the point I'm trying to prove here is that, you know, if you think a body language is just the eyes or just the feet or something and you concentrate 100% on that, you're going to miss all this other important stuff that may actually be telling the truth, they contradict themselves, yeah? So, look closer, go out, watch people, look at everything. 
I don't know if we've got time, but any questions, comments, good, bad? How hard is it? Sorry? How hard is it? Is it possible to learn how to have your uh, uh, micro movements mismatch what you would normally do? I, I guess that would be very interesting for poker players. Yeah, I'd say like general body language. I think you can be quite good at hiding that or catching yourself ahead of time. But like the micro expression stuff, because of it's happened like really at the subconscious level, I think you can hide it. But I think the problem is that people it's going to be really difficult to be that good at seeing it. So like um, contempt, like I can see that almost all the time. One because it's easy, but it's one as I'm familiar with seeing. So you might kind of realise you're suddenly going, mm, but then cover it up, but. Okay, so but if you uh, use other micro expressions and throw them away all the time, yeah. you might be able to disguise a little. Yeah. So again, this is so this is where it'd be an advantage. So if you're if you obviously when you know you're lying, um, instead of giving off the, that type of body language that might hint at it, you know you do the things that make you look more confident and try, try to deceive people. Well, cool. Thank you very much. <laughs>